Hello. Oh, we made it. Uh, <laughs> evening, really. Evening, Tom. Um, I think we're live now, um, so that all worked out. Uh, all right. Evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, really excited. Uh, first time we've done something like this live. Um, we've got three amazing panelists uh, with us tonight. Um, but yeah, really excited to see so many people uh, joining us tonight. Uh, a lot of old faces, but also uh, a lot of new ones uh, potentially starting out on a journey of uh, an ultra X or a multi-stage race or even just an ultra marathon. Um, just as a way of kicking things off, we've got a chat um, function in Teams, which uh, hopefully you've all got access to. Um, I'd love it if you could just maybe give us like a, a smiley if you've done a multi-stage event, uh, a thumbs up if you've done one with us and a high five if you've done nothing yet and are considering it, um, just so we can kind of get a bit of interaction and kind of see uh, the type of people that we've got here, the, the kind of level, uh, just so we can kind of frame it. But today, tonight is really about um, trying to give um, you as much confidence as possible going into this year um, and uh, to support you as best as we possibly can um, if it's an ultra X event it's a multi-stage event um, and give you some considerations um, when considering um, an event and how to approach one uh, it's only an hour long and there's probably probably months and years worth of material which we could go into a master stage. We're going to keep it very high level and it's going to be kind of principle based and consideration based um, rather than going into a lot of details. Um, we actually had about 300 people register for this and about 200 of those uh, sent in questions and I did kind of filter through and a lot of them are very specific. So we're going to be focusing quite general. If you do have specific questions, feel free to follow up with me or anyone at UltraX directly after this, and I'll do our best to, to support you, and we will have time for Q&A at the end. But um, we've only got an hour, so I'm kind of going to crack on um, a little bit. Um, just very quickly, um, I'm Sam. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of UltraX. Uh, we've been around for about five years. We organise multi-stage events all over the world. We've got 12 events this year, and really our goal is to encourage more people to take on big, scary adventures because we genuinely believe that the experience of a multi-stage event is one of the best things there is. Um, and we really want to be able to offer as much support as we can and encouragement to allow you to have those kind of experience. And we understand that it's a big step, so that's Kind of the purpose of this webinar. Um, as I said, we've got three amazing panelists who I'm going to let do most of the talking tonight. Um, so without further ado, it'd be really great, guys, if you could um, introduce yourselves, um, potentially starting from the top. Tom, if you could just give us uh, who you are, a little bit of background, um, that'd be amazing. Can you hear Tom? I can't hear you, Tom, mate. <laughs> Maybe try headphones out. <laughs> oh. Not yet. Maybe if we start with Catherine and then uh, hope Tom can sort out his, uh, his volume situation or you can just mine for us. Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll have a have a go at introducing myself. Um, I was going to go if I was going to go after Rini and Tom, I was going to be like, well, you know, I've won nothing. Um, I am very much your accidentally got into ultra running during COVID um, and fell in love with it, fell in love with the adventure of it. Um, so I am very much your novice runner. I'm in the middle to the back of the middle pack in the races. I'm never at the back, but I'm very much not at the front. Um, I am sort of your just like you runner um, and I've done Ultra X Jordan, Scotland, England was my first race, um, which was an experience uh, <laughs> to say the very least. Um, and yeah, I, I've only been running, running in itself for eight, eight years, I think. So I'm not actually a really experienced runner. 
um, not particularly fast. Um, so hopefully you'll get some good user friendly tips from me. And incredibly modest, because uh, <laughs> I think that's all a bit of an understatement. Um, and if we move on to uh, Rini. Hi, I'm Rini. I am a sports dietitian. I've been um, I've been the nutrition advisor person for Ultrex for a few years now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I I I've worked in sport for a very long time and work with a lot of runners, um, both at all different levels. Um, I'm a runner myself. Um, I've actually only done one of the Ultra X races, which is I'm a bit ashamed to say, but it was the it was England, um, which was great fun. Um, I enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I do. I have done lots of ultra running. That's kind of my thing. Um, but I like to do it because it also helps me to inform athletes, you know, not saying that what I do is what I provide, but I do test out a lot of the science out there and then can just give it that slightly more insightful um angle as well so you know because we know that science is great but it's not for everyone you know we're not all textbooks so we have to find our own way um so that's what i try and promote and that's me brilliant thank you should we try with tom <laughs> <laughs> no volume i'll introduce tom for now and uh I, when uh, when it comes to his first question, we can hope that he um, he has may, maybe try log out and log in again through a different uh, device. I'm not sure. Um, so Tom is um, was the world championship winner uh, at Ultra X uh, Slovenia last year, two years ago. In fact, time moves quickly. Um, uh, and he is a professional athlete. He came top Brit in UTMB last year and also top Brit at the um, Long Distance World Trail Championships last year. So he's very much here in the kind of elite capacity, hoping to um, answer some questions on, you know, training plans, uh, how to prepare for an event at that level um, and give you kind of that that kind of um, uh, insight into it. So we've got a really great broad range of um, experience and insights and all of our panellists um, have um, experience and ultra X, but also a, a wide uh, array of multi-stage events, which really is what this event is about. I think, you know, from my perspective, it's um, it's always a challenge getting to getting to across the message of what a multi-stage event really is until you've experienced it. Um, you know, it's not like a park run or a marathon where actually you turn up on the start line, you can kind of know what to expect. Every event is a little different and requires a little bit of thought. And, you know, that's part of the adventure. But hopefully these sessions can allow you to get to the start line feeling more confident, better prepared and mean that you can actually enjoy the event, uh, whatever it is, um, a little bit more. Um, so just quickly high level um, kind of agenda for the next 50 minutes. Um, firstly, we're going to touch on what is a multi-stage event. Um, you know, we've got many people here who won't have done one before. Um, we're going to then talk a little bit about how do you prepare, focus on the physical training element. Um, then we're going to touch a little bit on how do you fuel, focusing on, on nutrition. Again, uh, more considerations, um, what to think about when you're uh, creating a nutrition plan. Um, thirdly, how to manage yourself during event. One of the things which is different about a multi-stage event versus a marathon or a single stage is obviously the overnight element um, and making th the things you need to think about which aren't running or food um, during an event. Um, and then if we have some time at the end, um, we're going to open it up to any questions that you may have um, before before closing out. Um, so we've got Tom again. <laughs> You're on mute now. Morning. Excellent. Well, I've, well, I've introduced you. So, um, yeah. thanks. Go back on mute for now. And I'll <laughs> know it's to speak. <laughs> thanks. thanks. Um, cool. So, the first section is um, what is a multi stage event? And this is really designed to give you a little bit of understanding of what you might be able to expect um, um, at one of these events. And so, I guess. That is my question. I'm going to ask you, Catherine, if that's all right. I know you've done 
you've done Ultra X Jordan, you've done Ultra X England, but you've also done a load of different events, particularly, you know, I know you were out in Namibia earlier this year. So at a very high level, if someone sat down next to you in a, in a pub or a dinner party and said, you know, what, what is it? How would you explain it? I would explain it as uh, more of an adventure than a race from my perspective. So for me, I think about it as a bit of a holiday <laughs> um, with some fitness involved um, where you are running slash walking slash putting one foot in front of the other um, in a very safe environment in a slightly extreme condition. Um, day after day so whether that's a two-day event which I've done quite a few of or a, a longer five-stage event where you are in a little bubble for that amount of time from start till finish and the race race and everything about it the friends you meet the companions you meet are more of an experience in itself um, and the ultra x ones and quite a lot of other multi-stage races are in some amazing environments and countries. Um, and I think it is a way to see the world in a very different setting. I love that. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't add too much from it myself. Um, I guess a, a question for Rini. What are the, and, and we're going to go into a little more of the kind of specific details, but if you're considering doing a multi-stage event versus a single stage event, what would you say are the kind of the key considerations or challenges which you get in a multi-stage but not necessarily in a, in a in a single stage race? I think sometimes you have to think depending on um, the, the race and I've done quite a lot of multi-stage races um, and also depending on the environment as well. Most of my races I've done have been at altitude so there's a big consideration there around kind of your requirements at altitude and also what you're going to be able to consume because when you're trying to go up 4,000 meter passes and eat and breathe and move it's actually really challenging so you have to kind of work out okay so what formula am I going to use so I think understanding what you're letting yourself in for is a really big part of it in terms of what's the terrain you know really study the kind of the terrain and the the ascents and the descents and the the, the, the kind of environments it's going to be humid is it going to be cold is it like what do you need to think about um that's going to be really critical because that's what you then need to practice um and i think the key thing is learning to practice not just your in in day race nutrition but also thinking about what you're going to eat around you know like almost practicing right am i what porridge am i going to take with me if that's what you're going to take which rehydrated meal am i going to eat in the evening what's the best way to make these rehydrated meals because they're not all the same and actually for most of them you tend to need to let them stand and obviously by the time you finish a race you're starving you're hungry you're cold you just want to go to bed well that's me anyway um and so it's about trying to think about, well, how do you stagger that? How do you make that? So the things I often think about is recovery is really key. But remember, you're carrying it. So, again, the weight of your food, the amount of space it's going to take up. Remember, most multi-day stage events, you're only allowed to take a certain amount with you as your kind of travel bag because understandably there's lots of competitors and they have to move these bags along so it's that's just how it is so it's it's about thinking you know being quite smart and thinking about how you're going to get your energy in always have things you look forward to that's my biggest biggest tip so although yes get the tick off the kind of macronutrients and stuff but always have your snickers bar or your peanut m ms or whatever it is that you fancy because at some point you will hit a low moment and then you can open that bar of chocolate and feel a little bit of joy for a few moments before you move on again. So I think the key thing is really understanding what you're letting yourself in for in terms of the race environment and then thinking way ahead and practicing, you know, like before some of my events, I've I've really thought about, well, do I need liquid? Do I want bars? Do I want chews? What What is it that's going to and then really practicing in my running so that I know that I can take it on board and trying to get as close as I can. It's not always easy in the UK, but trying to get as close as I can to the environments I'm going to be running in to to practice that. So I think that's that's where it's different and and understanding that recovery really is important. I remember when I was first researching multi-day nutrition uh, way back when I was a student and one of the key research 
studies that I read, which has really stuck with me all this time, is that the difference between finishing and not finishing in multi-day is actually your hydration and your recovery. So being hydrated is really, really critical. And again, a lot of us will think, oh, I don't need to drink because I don't want to get up and I'm sleeping in the tent. It's annoying. That's going to hold you back if you don't, you know, if you don't, if you don't kind of meet those requirements. So those are the things to think about. Yeah, I, and I think that kind of the specificity, specificity is super important. And I think it's something that kind of, I guess, someone who's used to road running or maybe used to slightly different form of events is very easy to not not get but you know and i think it's one of the most exciting things about ultra and trail in general is you know every event is different and every event requires a slightly different approach and you can look at you said you know say the 100 mile distance and you know the fastest person doing 100 miles in the world does it in about 12 hours but the most competitive race in the world which is a mountain race is you know the fastest people do it in 20 hours so it's it's a completely different approach and that affects your nutrition, your hydration, your your training. And the same way, the type of multi-stage event, the type of event will also affect the way you kind of approach it. Um, I guess moving on to a bit of a, like a focus on kind of the physical um, preparation. And, you know, I think naturally one of the biggest perceived barriers for these events, the biggest challenges is, is often the distance. And, you know how you prepare physically for that you know 220 250 110 kilometers these are all really big numbers um how, how do you approach that and how do you kind of start to approach that i guess a question for tom our in-house athlete to talk me through the kind of the thought process when you're you know you'll say you're you're choosing a a five day event in say a year's time what what would what would you recommend to a beginner and what would you recommend when starting out kind of building that plan yeah so if you have a, a whole year like you don't need to jump straight in to like big volume running at all you can just build up gradually so you really want to focus on your strength and then just an aerobic base because those two components are really what's going to get you through a multi-day event. So if you're into cycling or any other form of cross training, then I suggest you start there. And then as the event approaches, you can then gradually ramp up your running. Um, and in terms of volume, I would say if you want to compete, uh, if you're going for the win, then if you can do a similar amount of time in a week, of training during like your peak week that you'd expect to do during the race so let's say a 220k five day event you're probably going to be out there for what five hours a day roughly so if you're trying to compete obviously this is like at the front end then you know building up to 20 hours a week in your peak week of training would be a, a good rough estimate if you're looking to complete i.e just get around or you know middle pack to backpack runner then i'd say you can probably do half that amount and you can still get around so like for a 220k event you still don't actually need to do a huge amount of training per week as long as you've got that sort of base fitness and strength fitness so again they might be aiming more towards that 10 hours a week in the peak sort of period of training and say so that might equate to maybe up to 100 kilometers depending on how fast that runner is but i know people who have never done a marathon and they've gone and you know they've gone smashed like five day events yeah we we've actually I mean, we we often do uh, after every event we do a survey of our competitors five days and actually we know that more than half of the people that complete and finished our five day events have never run a marathon at the point that they signed down. So there's definitely a, and, and that's not to say they haven't by the time they get to the start line, but I think often overestimate volume and, and often, you know, there's, there can be some quite toxic groups or there can be people that, you know, like to chase Strava or whatever. And actually, um, you know, being sensible and, and working out what's right for you is, is really important. Um, Catherine, you, you signed down to Ultra X England having run one marathon. Talk me through your, your training for that. And also, if you were to go back now, knowing what you know now, how would you approach that event? 
Oh, that's such a good question. Well, the, I did it in 2020 when there was, what, like six, seven weeks notice um, and I signed up on a bit of a whim. I had been running very regularly in COVID and lockdown um, and I was a much faster runner when I was going out to run general runs then and I am now. Now I take it really easy and saunter around. Um, so for that, what I did is I just started running longer distances both days on the weekends um went down to the the north was it the north downs or south downs the south downs i think it was um and naively thought that oh that would be some good hill training having never been to the peak district before in my life um so that was the the training that i was doing i'd also at that time my bike hadn't been stolen so i was doing a bit of cycling around it so that my volume wasn't going up, going up too much um, and making sure that I was getting my strength work in as well. If I was to go back and do England now, knowing what I know, I definitely would either spend a bit more time on the stair stepper in London, because that's where I live, there's not a lot of hills here, or there is a couple of quite punchy hills in Richmond Park that you can just go up and down, Broomfield Hill, just up and down and up and down. Um, the terrain I now know is, is a little bit more rugged underfoot, so just getting more time out in, in conditions and, and really strengthening my ankles. Um, I found that I had a point of weakness there, so now um, I just work on sort of the flexibility of my ankles and things. Um, so yeah, that, that race in particular, um, you know, that was a, a key learning point for me is, um, I mean, I kind of did the like, go until you can't go anymore and then died at the end of day one, but managed to get round day two, recovered, got the fuel in, um, somehow made it round. It took me a lot of hours, I'm not gonna lie. Um, and we did get lost, but other than that, it was great. <laughs> well, I think that's the nice thing about a multi or ultras in general is that, you know, when you do your marathon, you're going to the office on Monday morning and someone's gonna turn to you and say, Catherine, how, how long did it take you? Whereas you could say five hours, you could say, 105 hours and actually the reaction is probably going to be pretty similar um, which I always feel is actually you know takes the pressure off a little bit and I, and I also just thought I'd touch on um, a, a point kind of Tom made there about kind of volume and, and time and you know and, it, and I, I a question we get asked frequently and actually a question which was asked it pre pre this um, a, a few times is you know what's the magic number what what how far do I need to go in my longest run prior to the event and I and I just really want to encourage people not to worry about that it's far more important to focus on consistent mileage over time than your kind of golden long run particularly if it's gonna mean that you're not training the week before or two weeks before because you're building up to it and then you're recovering after it it's it's it really actually doesn't matter that much that that specific long run so I just thought I'd use an opportunity to kind of touch on that um but I also just going back to the kind of as a kind of someone who may be considering this and may not have done something before question for really do you, do you think there is a kind of a base level of fitness for something like this before you set say a, a two-day 110 kilometer event before you you know make make that leap so this might not make me very popular um but it is something I feel quite strongly about I do think people should come from a fairly regular fitness background. So I don't think deciding that your first run is going to be the 110 is a good idea because running is, um, it takes its toll on the body. And depending on your background, you know, running means that you need really strong pelvis you need really strong glutes you need really strong ankles as Catherine has just said like you you need a strong body and I think a lot of people may get away with 110 first time possibly particularly if they're young and um you know bounce back a lot quicker but when you get to my age and it's your if it's your first ultra it wouldn't be it wouldn't be something I would recommend I also really don't recommend it to very young people either I think there's lots of other things you can do first to really get strong get that strong kind of uh sort of training age as I call it and that sort of strong um foundation before you potentially start so I personally think you do need an element of strength 
whether that you know I don't think you just need to be big running like have done loads and loads of runs but I do think you need an element of strength and some training so like if you get you know you get lots of people who've played loads of football as a teenager those people will probably do really well but if you've always been really non-sporty and suddenly decide on your 21st birthday to sign up for 110 and that's the first thing you've ever done I think you may struggle and end up injured and and I think on that like what sort of just going on from what both Tom and Catherine were saying I do think also especially if you're a novice to these multi-stage and, and ultra distance in general is remember that body takes time to recover so if you are you know you don't want to go out every weekend and be doing massive long mileage all the time because you will get tired and then you might not even make it to the start line and and the biggest mistake I see in my clinic from runners and particularly those who sort of sign up for their first ultra is they try and do too much they don't recover properly and then they never even make it to the start line so I think that's kind of something I would say is just almost as well think about what the what the outcome is you're looking for like like Tom said I mean if you're in it to win it then you have a whole different mindset to if you're just in it to complete it and actually if it's completion that you want you want to enjoy it as well like you know <laughs> you don't want to be really painful all the way through it so you just need to sort of go with that attitude and enjoy it and then you can do another one and you can do another one and you can do another one if that's what you want to do but just kind of this first one see it as a learning opportunity and a place to kind of gather your thoughts afterwards and reflect to improve yeah we, we've got a kind of saying which we say quite a lot is that you're better 20 percent under trained than one percent over and 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 you know <laughs> When you've done the training, you're going to be able to get through it, providing you manage your tracing, your pacing appropriately. But if you are, do turn up stressed with a niggle, with a whatever, um, it just makes the whole thing much more uncomfortable. At the end of the day, as I always say, you know, these are these are holidays. We should be trying to enjoy them. You know, we're very fortunate to be able to explore all these amazing parts of the world. So, um, yeah, I, I guess just very quickly on the injury piece, um, a question for Tom. How how do you try and manage not getting injured? Do you have any advice? Uh, my biggest one is just tra is strength training. Um, so whether that is doing walks and runs with a little bit of weight, I would suggest probably starting with walking is one of the sort of all things we used to do in the military to help strengthen um, the system, but equally work in the gym. Um, it doesn't have to be heavy weights. It just needs to be, like you said earlier, like a consistent regiment of weight training. Um, and for me, you know, I do 90 hours of work in the gym a year. And since I've been sticking, which is quite a lot, but um, you know you don't have to do that much but if you stick to just it's just two or three sessions a week that will make a huge difference in in injury prevention that would be my number one go-to the second one is probably Rennie's area of expertise but is is diets because if you're not recovering from training properly then you're going to get injured so eat more than you think you need both in training and in racing that's always my go-to and then third one is sleep which is obviously no brainer. Don't have to say any more on that one. Get as much as you can. Perfect. I agree with all that. And I and I think the other thing I'd add to that is just having having some form of training plan that means you're you're monitoring your load. Um, I think it's very easy to you know get excited and build up quickly and then find yourself injured. And and just making sure that you are tracking how much volume you're doing when you're building up means that you can be sensible about that and and try and avoid injury as best possible. Um, Moving on, so we've already touched on it a little bit already, but the nutrition and the hydration part, you know, as, as Rini said at, at, the, at the beginning, it is one of the most important aspects. And actually, at our events, I probably see more people get the dead dreaded DNF and not finish the event related to nutrition issues and not being able to fuel it um, properly rather than physical fitness. Because obviously, even the the fittest person will not perform over five days if they can't get their fuel in. Um, really, for someone that is starting out on their on their journey uh, and considering uh, a multi stage race and considering creating a plan, a nutrition plan for a race, what would you recommend them to look at? What would you recommend them to consider? So I'm gonna. 
I'm going to reiterate what Tom just said about eating more than you think you need to. I think one of the biggest misconceptions we have around food, particularly when we're physically active, is that we don't need much. You know, oh, I don't need it. I'm just doing a 5K or I've just been to the gym and my heart rate didn't go up. And it's like, no, because every time you do anything physical, your body needs energy to, to do it. But it also needs energy to allow for the adaptation to occur. You're not going to get stronger. You're not going to get you're not going to get any progression if you don't fuel the the bits that happen afterwards. And that's what people forget. They just think about what they need in that moment rather than the, the bigger picture. So that's my first bit of advice is you are probably going to need more than you've ever eaten before and you're probably going to have to kind of accept that it's not it's definitely not move more eat less it's definitely move more eat more without a doubt um i think the key things are i personally don't recommend as much as possible especially if you're new to things as well i wouldn't recommend doing faster training because again that will just put more stress on the system and more likely to cause you to become injured or even ill potentially um, and again prevents that kind of cons cons you know consistency in training um so and it's really difficult like tom's just said you, you do need to put some hours in and if you're working full time it can be difficult and i know a lot of people that get up at 5 a.m to try and fit their runs in around work and you know or finish late and and, and fueling can then get quite um compromised and that's i suppose the the thing that most people come to me for is well, how do i get this right when i'm trying to juggle all these different elements of my life and i think the key thing to remember is that fueling it, thinking about what you need you definitely need a good source good sources of carbohydrate throughout the day, not just even around your training, like you need to be thinking about them regularly throughout the day, because remember that we've only got a finite source of energy from um, our carbohydrates, you know, our carbohydrates stored in our muscles as glycogen, and that will only really last two hours of moderate training. So, but if you're running every day, which most of us, you know, or even five days a week, which you put, a, lot, a lot of you will be doing in, in terms of attempting um, an event like this, you're constantly also using your glycogen stores. So it's really hard to keep on top of it. A lot of people don't realize. And so what can happen is you might get, you know, you might get, you maybe you take a weekend off and you eat really well and you start that Monday with full glycogen stores. You go out for a run on Monday, you've probably depleted 50, 60% of them. And then although you try and eat a bit more, if it's really hard to get full stores, that's why we do, you know, we do the loading as well. You get the taper and the loading because that's how you encourage good full stores. So I think what I often say to people is that by the time they get to Friday, if they've not fueled properly throughout the week. They're running on empty. Like they've got no glycogen stores left and then they're trying to push themselves. So carbohydrate has to be your friend throughout the day. And if you are doing early morning training, try and make sure you find things that are easy for you to consume. So that might be like a banana or it might even be a glass of juice or or even like if, there's a, if there is a sports drink that you particularly like and you're going to use in the race as well, like practice with that. You don't, we're not talking about having a massive bowl of porridge before you go out for an early morning run, but we are talking about having some carbohydrate availability there. And then obviously thinking about um, your recovery as well. So again, this is going to be really key, especially in the race as well. But as, and when you're doing like weeks and weeks and weeks of training, you will notice that your appetite will go up. But you'll also notice that you might crave certain foods. Like I personally find when I'm doing heavy training, all I can think about are actually quite high protein foods. Like I just want eggs and I want cheese and I want tofu because I'm vegetarian. Um, I want the things that that my body is obviously craving because it's it's trying to repair. So it still needs the carbs, but it also needs those kind of building blocks too. Um, so it's not like you need to eat significantly differently, but you just probably need to be quite mindful about the timing of your nutrition and ensuring that you increase your nutrition alongside the volume and the intensity. Remember, the faster you go, the more you burn. So if you are doing sessions, if you're going to do some hill reps, if you're going to do some tempo style work or you're going to do some interval work and all these things are really good to help your running economy and running efficiency, um, even in the longer distance stuff, then you're going to use those stores up a lot faster. So you're going to need to make sure you replace them. And some people really struggle with the volume of food they need as they start to increase. And so. One thing I will say is you might have to throw out some of the healthy eating guidelines out the window, which 
I don't think is a problem for a short period of time um, and, and actually use things that are easy digestible. You know, so, you know, having some drinks that maybe provide you with energy, they might not give you anything else, but they do deliver the carbohydrate can be quite an, a useful way of getting energy in. I'm a big fan of milkshakes for recovery and you can get them everywhere. Milk is cheap. Like, you know, you can you can kind of use that. And that's a really good source of energy as well. Um, you might need to fill up on having desserts and, and you know, sort of having a bit of cake or whatever or biscuits because you will need to get the energy in without volume. And some people can. Some people can have the double the portion of pasta and it's fine. And some people can't. And I think often it's a male female split. Generally, women find it a bit harder just because we're smaller. So we we do get full quicker. So when I'm racing or training for something, it's lots of little, often snacks, meals, and I'm constant, fundamentally constantly eating during that time. But it's lots of things that are easily digestible. Difficult to follow up with much more than that, but thank you so much. That's super useful. From, from my personal perspective, I found one of the the biggest challenges was actually working out how to, you know, take on the right amount of nutrition during um, the event. And actually, one thing I found really important, which I think a lot of people don't do, and we see a lot of people don't do, is they create an, a strategy for their race. Uh, and that will be nutrition. And it might follow a lot of the guidelines that Rini's kind of spoken about, but they don't do it when they train. And it's a bit like wanting to run an 18 minute 5k, but training at a 30 minute 5k pace you know it just won't work so when you're doing your training try and incorporate and, and just like the mileage and the volume building up slowly but try and incorporate some form of nutrition um, in it is really really important as it's kind of touched on there um question for tom and catherine here um because you know i think what works for people is often very different and you know, whilst you may go to a run or marathon, you see very similar things in people's um, hands and pockets, and they're often gels and sugar coated. You know, when it comes to ultras, it gets a bit more interesting, a bit more exciting. Just, I guess, same question to both of you, maybe starting with Tom. You've both got a lot of experience in different events. What, what, what are you taking now? What's in your bag in terms of nutrition and food? And what mistakes have you made in the past or what have you changed over the past few years? Good question. Uh, definitely have followed the trend of pushing more carbohydrates. So definitely in the last few years, there's been a sort of advance in how many grams per hour you can take on. So I would now say for any race, I'm now at 100 grams per hour, if not more. Um, foods, I do, I do stick to things like gels, uh, chews, um, liquid drinks, for durations maybe up to 10 hours and then after that I start to find that the stomach despite how much you train it will start to give you a bit of um will fight back a bit so that's when for longer races 100k distances 100 miles definitely need solid foods for me personally um, and that just gives you something more in the stomach to hold on to and then you're also getting things like a bit of fat protein a bit more complex stuff some salt as well because you're not always getting enough salt through gels and drinks and, and liquids um so i find that's a real key one for like the long stuff but otherwise yeah just um all the usual stuff and there's no you know all the brands they all have pretty similar um nutritional um content so there's not a particular one i'd recommend but like you say just practice as much as you can in training um i try and do like a, a long run where I'll fit in like a three course lunch so then I'll run back down the mountain with you know three courses in your stomach and that will certainly train your gut to deal with anything on race day. Good idea. Uh, Catherine do you do a similar, similar approach? Uh, no I don't because I have IBS so I can't really use gels that much at all. Um, tailwind I find really good to have in your fluids. Um, I have a bit of a strategy that I tried and tested myself. I just eat something every 30 minutes. It works for me. Um, so there's been some questions about what real food so Sorin. Um, I can't have the original one anymore because of Jordan, but now I'm on the banana and I'm not off that yet. Um, I take hula hoops, 
Salt and vinegar peanuts are really great in a hot environment because you've got the nuts, but the salt and vinegar, just the taste buds in that environment, they were essential for me in Namibia. Um, I also have um, salt sticks, which I use for my electrolytes because I don't like the taste of the dissolvable ones. Uh, you don't want to know how many of those I took on my last desert race. Um, it was very many, but um, get ones with extra things in, not just salt is what I would recommend. Um, and just make sure there's things. So for me, I don't really like having hot water. So this is my other little go to is my little Robinson squash. Um, that saved me a lot just at a checkpoint, being able to put in a bottle a bit of nice tasting fluid to go down. Um, although the medics will say don't have red liquids if you are dehydrated or something like that. But if you if you're well hydrated, um, I would recommend that. So yeah, lots of plain foods. If it is something like a race in the UK where you can prepare, I've used things like little flatbready type sandwiches with I'm gonna sound really northern here. <sighs> paste like poor man's pate like chicken and ham paste because it's got loads of protein in loads of salt um and it's just really good or it's, it moistens the bread without sort of being like a filling that's going to come out of your sandwich um yeah showing where i'm from there by saying that but that is a is a, a winner on if you're doing say england or scotland and you can take something with you um and they, they squeeze nicely if you get the little flatty things you can get warburton's flatties or little pita breads work really well Nice. Yeah, I think uh, my my first ultra, I remember I pretty much fueled 75% on my arm stripes and I can't look at them anymore, but uh, it worked for me at the time. Um, conscious that we've got 18 minutes roughly left uh, and I want to leave a little bit of time for kind of questions, but moving on to the um, kind of management during the event, um, gear and equipment, campsite etiquette, things like that, um, and also I guess mental side of things you know these are long events um i'd be really interested in um you know maybe starting with tom whether you have any specific mental strategies you employ during training or during an event like this um to get through uh, mental strategies um there are plenty um half the battle is mental so uh, i mean i use I suppose positive uh, thinking, you know, it's the difference between a lot of people on the start line in terms of physical capacity is very small, but there's often quite a big difference in the mindset. Um, and so it's like the person who's standing on the line going, I am going to win this race or, you know, I am going to do well. I am going to reach the finish line in a good time has this positive reinforcement um, loop and you tend to then do well in a race. It's when you stand on the start line going, oh, I'm not sure if my training's gone all right. I'm, you know, I'm worrying about things that you tend to actually then not believe in yourself. And the body, you know, responds to how how you're feeling, the response to the mind. So a positive outlook is definitely a big one for me. Yeah, definitely. And and uh, really, any any thoughts on that or anything you use? So I I'm a big. I'm big on mindfulness. It's, I mean, I, I teach mindfulness, I practice mindfulness, and I do find a, a lot of the races I've done are quite sketchy. Um, so there are moments where I fear my life and I find being mindful in that moment is actually quite helpful. Um, but actually something I encourage when I'm crewing for athletes or or kind of supporting people who are doing these longer races, something that can be quite nice is actually having um, little voice notes or little letters from home um, that can read. I know when I was out in Nepal, um, I did two things. One, I would voice note. Um, I didn't have any signal, but I was voice noting because I wanted to kind of feel like I was talking. So I'd voice note my partner um, just how I'd been doing and how things have been going for me. And then when I did get Wi-Fi, which was actually when we got back to Kathmandu, so I'd done the race, um, he got all of them in one go. But equally, he had done the same. So it's actually quite nice that when I kind of had that. But also my daughters had both put letters in my pack so that I could open them up when I needed them with when I had a bit of a low moment and I think those things can be really really helpful just little strategies of just keeping you moving forward and equally um, depending on the race I always ask usually my daughters to create some sort of playlist and you and, and as my daughter said to me today she said 
expect the unexpected mum. So, which is generally what happens, which is kind of cool because again, it just distracts you from the pain or the suffering that you're going on in in that in that moment. And it can you might only use it for an hour, but it can often be the, the, the enough to get you through and move you forwards. Yeah. Yeah, and I always find, you know, trying to remember why you signed down in the first place and, and reminding yourself that you did <laughs> most of the time pay for this um, is, uh, is is useful. Um, Catherine, you've done Jordan with us. You've also done, just recently got back from Namibia and you've done a load of multi-stage races. At a multi-stage race, half of the time spent is actually not running, is, is not timed. It's in the campsite or it's, um, you know, moving between how do you do to what do you do to um i guess manage yourself and make sure you perform during the actual races in that in that period um if it is an ultra x race and they have osteos available the first thing i do is put my number race number on the list to go and see the osteos because if you have a little rub down or you've got anything that needs cricking back into place that is key uh foot care and blister care um, there is a new company being set up, which used to be Exile Medics, which is now going to be Expedition Medics. Um, and they're doing the spine race at the minute, but they are going to do a series of blister care videos. And I said, being able to do your feet yourself will save you a lot of time. Taking some little green needles with you, some clean ones that you can just pop them, knowing how to drain them so they don't get infected. Um, because there will be cues for the medics like there are cues for the osteos. So that is a key tip from me. Um, the other thing that I do straight away is I take with me, it's another top tip for any traveling, but a Nalgene bottle takes hot and cold water. So I also do one thing which I don't have on this because I couldn't find my duct tape, but duct tape and gaffer tape, you can wrap around it. So if you've got any clothes that have ripped, bags that have ripped, you can use it. And in my hot one, my recovery fuel, so that I do this straight away. So I take a night fuel, which has bits of magnesium and stuff. Um, I take that instead of having like a protein shake or something, because I hate those with water. And that's just like a hot chocolate, that night night fuel. So something like that um, gets straight into me while I'm preparing my food. Um, and yeah, just making sure that I'm really organized. So for that, dry bags. I was well prepared for this, Blue Peter presenter. Um, so I just have everything for each day in a separate dry bag or a separate food bag. Um, and it just means when you're looking through your kit, you're just like, right, what do I need now? Right, where's tomorrow's kit? Where's my clean socks? What am I going to do now? And it just makes everything easier. So I'd say just be really organised um, when you get back to camp and just make sure you're resting. It's quite tempting to sit and be quite sociable. Um, but just be careful how much you're doing that and what time you're trying to go to bed because sleep is never the easiest on these events. So just another tip, just don't be too sociable. Yeah. Learn that from yeah. experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there's many bodies in one tent. It's always fun. Um, OK, I, for, for every, um, well, for every multi stage, for a lot of ultras, you're going to get given a, a standard mandatory kit list, um, which is I just want to make very clear, it's not just the minimum, it's not the kit you need, you're going to need some other things as well. What what are the things that each of you take um, in your in your kit list, maybe a couple of items, maybe maybe more, um, which are not on the mandatory, you know, personal comforts, things that make your experience easier, things that might be good for, to consider uh, for um, for people thinking about doing their event that they might, might not be so obvious. Um, I know Catherine, you just touched on a couple, so maybe if we start with Tom. Yeah, definitely. Uh, earbuds for noise at night. Um, I find you can actually get away sometimes with headphone earbuds as well if you want to like double up. But yeah, it's, if you get some good earbuds, that's good. Air mattress or like some inflatable, something for the tent to sleep on. It'll make the nights much more comfortable. Same with like a pillow as well. These are things I learned the hard way on the first round that I thought I could just use my bag or, you know, use a rolled up jacket, but it, your sleep's just not as good. Um, they would be the big two. And then again, food, like you want to bring as much food as you can possibly bring, because if you can't get more from like locally, I think it depends on the race, then you don't want to be going to bed hungry and like waking up under, under fueled and under recovered. Awesome. Uh, really? Yeah, I guess similar. I guess the thing I tend to do is take a fresh, I take a freshly washed pillowcase in the 
washing conditioner and laundry liquid that I normally use because it makes me think of home. It kind of helps me to kind of keep that um, going. So that's something I always do. Even if I just put my jumpers in it, I always take that so that it smells like home. Um, and food definitely always have something comforting, something that I'm looking forward to because I know inevitably I'm going to have a moment where all I want is to feel comfort. So thinking about that really helps. Um, and that's pretty much it, really. Otherwise, I'm I'm quite lean in my in my choices when I go away. Uh, Catherine, any, anything you haven't mentioned, anything extra you might put in your your bag? So on my last race I did, I had to carry all my stuff with me, which was um, horrific. But um, the one thing, the one thing I took extra on top of sort of mandatory plus food was tea bags and little milk sticks. So I could have a proper cup of tea, not just with powdered milk. It just made such a difference having that at the end of a day and at the start of a day. And it's just the little things that will keep you going throughout it all. So, yeah. Um, but I just, on top of that, never, never negate the food that you take with you. That is always one thing. Um, never to scrimp on if you've got to save weight somewhere. Always keep that in your bag. Yeah, I think the only the only two things that I would add, uh, which haven't been mentioned, is a pair of shoes which you could slip on very easily post event, which cover your toes, um, so you don't want to be walking around the sand with you know open blisters and um which uh you don't want to be shoving your feet into you know tight trainers uh, and you want to be making sure you get air and something to slide in so you know stealing a pair of uh slippers from a hotel or something like that work really nicely if, if you're limited on weight um and the other thing which is uh just quite close to Catherine's point as well is uh, a little thing of tabasco or like chili powder can really make a freeze dried meal a little bit more exciting um, because actually I said that there's a lot of very good freeze dried meals now, um, but a lot of them are um, still not the most wonderful things and, and you're going to be kind of surviving off those for the for the duration of the week. Um, we've got eight minutes left. Um, so um, I'd just like to take the opportunity now before I open up to questions just to thank uh, our three panelists for giving up their uh, their Wednesday evenings. Um, just yeah, really really appreciate it. Um, it's always a pleasure seeing you and seeing the start line. And yeah, just thank you so much for sharing uh, your wisdom, your experience, uh, and and hopefully the audience really really appreciate it as well. Um, thank you to everyone for turning up and and joining us and listening and supporting Ultra X. Uh, I really hope that you know if you're on the fence, we've inspired maybe a few of you to to do something, whether it's with Ultra X or whether it's anything else, um, you know, if we can get you to do something you're a little bit scared of, I think that's a, that's a really good thing. Um, so yeah, we'd love to see you soon. If you do have any like questions which you don't want to ask now, um, please feel free to send them over to me um, of our email or just contact Ultra X. Um, we've also got a load of resources on our website, um, blogs written by various people. Um, and actually now we've got quite a database. So head over there if you want a bit more information. Um, but for now, we've got five minutes of uh, time for questions before we all head off. Um, so I'm just going to scroll through. Please feel free to put questions in the chat if you've got any. Um, let's have a little scroll. John West Universe. Uh, I'm afraid we're not going to be at the National Running Show this weekend, sorry. Um, I am. Really is. I am, <laughs> but yeah. Um, best hotel to stay in. So um, most, uh, each stage race is a little bit different. Some uh, for, from Ultra X, we typically have a partner hotel. Um, where we recommend competitors go. We don't make it obligatory and then we usually um, hold the uh, race briefing there as well. Um, uh, <laughs> so uh, um, yes, usually you can you can book a hotel. Um, otherwise, I'd recommend something convenient close to the start line. Um, I always injure myself post run. Um, 
how do you prevent that on day one of a multi-day? That's a good question from Jasmine. Um, I mean, my thoughts and open up to the to the to the floor are that um, you might want to take it a little easier on day one. Um, you know, I think the great thing about uh, stage races is that um, you know you're always really holding on to quite near the end. It's all really more of a preservation rather rather than like a marathon where you might be you know just leaving it all on the field. So. I'd say um, trying to hold back a little bit at the end of the day um, for, for a five day event, really the race begins on the on the dawn of the long day, which is typically three or four days in. Um, so and on a two day event, it's really probably the second half of the second day. So I would almost take trade take uh treat it mentally as you're getting to the start line um in the in the first build up of the event i don't know if um any of our panelists have anything to kind of add on that yeah i just say take it easy you don't you don't go out like an idiot I'm not saying you are jasmine but just that would be my i've seen it every time i do a race people think and also if you're going if you've always run on road or even fairly flat and then you're suddenly going into terrain that's a bit tricky you can't maintain that same pace. It's just not going to happen. Like, and and same with heat, same with altitude. You know, yeah. those all those environments are going to also affect how fast you can go. I would also add to that as well. There will be stages where you are in different positions. So, like one of the stages on the recent race I did, I started off and I was like, oh no, I've not taken painkillers. My blisters hurt. I was, I think, twenty five started that day. I was in twenty third, but. I just kept picking people off. So never worry if you're like towards the back when you're starting off because people will start to fall and get tired and they'll have gone off too fast. If you're that one that's then coming up behind them with your walking poles going 10 to the dozen up a hill and they're like, God, she's going fast. And you're like, yeah, well, you know, uh, back on form now. So like never worry about things like that. Don't let your ego get in the way of anything. Just, you know, keep quite calm about it because anything can happen you know big names can drop out of races I don't know if anyone's watching the spine race like it's just yeah somebody's at the front and then they're all of a sudden out of the race like things can happen on multi-day events people can get sick stomach bugs whatever so just do your own thing and don't worry about any anybody else yeah. um couple of questions here just very quickly uh Sharon uh insurance Yes, you will need insurance for most. Uh, well, you will need insurance for any multi-stage event. Um, Dog tag uh, were the company we recommended. They they seem to have. I think they kind of they had a they closed down during COVID, and I think they are back up and running. But you just might want to check that. Otherwise, ITRA um, are the people that we recommend, uh, and they provide cover for these type of events. And then uh, maybe the final question to close with: We can't have a whole session without talking about shoes at least once. We get a lot of questions about what shoes do I need to wear uh, for this this event. The the, the answer is um, usually the shoes which fit you best and you're most comfortable in. Um, you know, there is no um, magic shoe. Um, and um, you know, we did a few articles on our um, media page about some of the trainers which are worn at each event and you'll see there's a huge range um so whatever's comfortable and whatever you're used to running in. and if you're used to running in road shoes i'd recommend going to a shop and saying these are what i run in is there an equivalent trail variation um with regard to number of shoes um what do our panel think how, how many shoes are necessary for a five-day race i'd have one pair that I would run the race in, but I would take a spare pair because often in these races you'll, you know, catch a rock, tear a shoelace or whatever, you know, destroy one shoe. If you've only got one pair, then that's game over. So take a spare pair. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree with Tom. I think the only thing I'd say is that in a lot of stage races, um, you don't have the luxury of being able to carry a spare pair. Um, at Ultra X events, we do take a, a main hold bag between campsites for you. Um, you know, other other event organisers out there will require you to carry everything for the week. And in that case, I don't think two shoes, two pairs of shoes, is really an option. So I think one one pair is is really the only the only choice you have, and you just want to make sure you look after them. 
Well, uh, that's seven o'clock. Um, so amazingly, we got through everything and uh, got through uh, on time. So yeah, just a final huge thank you from me. Um, thank you for joining us. Have a great evening, everyone. Have a great 24. And hopefully we'll see you uh, in person at some point this year or next. Cheers all.